So before we move on from the slide, I want to just sure. spotlight a couple of things you said and, and not push back, but just, um, you know. Well, you push back on me all the time, Michael. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I have students from all walks of life and we try to be a center ground for everything. And so I don't want this to turn into like a one-sided argument. So the first thing I would just say that I totally agree with you on is that you know, hundreds of millions of people have gotten this vaccine. And if there was going to be some terrible side effects, for all those conspiracy uh, prone people out there, I think that they would have bubbled up immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we've seen how, if there's even one person that gets, you know, shot by a police officer, then it's gonna be front and center on the news right away. And so if there were some really terrible uh, side effects and people dying from this vaccine, you would have heard of them, trust me, they would have been spotlighted. Um, but the things that, that I would push back just a little bit, or I just want to get your opinion on like, why you think this happened is, I remember when, when you know, uh, Donald Trump was our president and he was pushing for the vaccine, everyone in the media that I was listening to constantly was saying how they're not going to get this vaccine because they're worried it's, it's being rushed too fast through and that it's not going to be safe. And then, and I even... I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I almost remember you expressing some concerns about the uh, the speed at which it was getting pushed through. <clears throat> now I hear the complete opposite from media, from you. And so I think they're, that's why some people are concerned. They're just not, they're not sure. They, they worry that maybe there's some grand conspiracy there. Maybe you can shed some light on that. Hey, Dad, how's it going? <laughs> I'm doing fine, son. I'm so happy to have you on the show. And, um, you know, a lot of people say they have uh, doctors in the family, but very few people have an actual specialist on the pandemic that's going uh, through our country right now, going through the world. And I thought, why not have you, get, you come and, and sit down and talk a little bit about COVID-19 with my students? Um, because I, I don't know as much about you and your career as I'd like, I had to go online and do a little research, uh, which is uh, embarrassing because I know you are very accomplished at what you do. And when I was doing it, I found a couple of uh, times that you were on television talking about COVID-19. So I really appreciate you coming on our little podcast of, you know, 50 some people uh, to talk about this. But you know, I think it's a really important topic and I think you have a lot of uh, cre uh, key critical insight to impart. You know, and you've talked to me a lot about what to do with my school and it's because of a lot of the recommendations that you've given me that we've uh, been able to avoid having COVID-19 in our school for uh, since the very beginning of the pandemic, except for just this last weekend, someone came down with a case of COVID, which is really unfortunate and I we're wishing them the best. Um, but it's partly because of that, that I wanted to have you on the show to talk about it a little bit more. But anyway, while I was uh, searching for some information on you and your career, I, I stumbled upon your, uh, your school's website and you're the, the president of, uh, uh, or former president, I'm not sure, of SGU. And uh, I'm, still the, I'm still the president's son, yeah. Still the president. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how this all works, but um, let me uh, pull this up and oh, a very nice uh, picture of you there, dad. And I'm going to kind of read it off to our to our students because they don't really know much about you. Tell them a little bit about your accolades and what you've accomplished. Um, an educator, physician, and administrator during, uh, during a distinguished career spanning more than 30 years, Dr. G. Richard Olds has served as the president of St. George University since August 2015. Dr. Olds is dedicated to the advancement of the university and students and collectively hopes to help address the shortage of maldistribution of physicians in the United States and around the world. Prior to joining SGU, Dr. Olds was the Vice Chancellor of Health Affairs and founding Dean of the School of Medicine at the University of California, Riverside. In 2010, he joined the UCR lead to lead the creation of a new School of Medicine, the first LCME accredited medical school in California in more than four decades. Dr. Olds is a graduate of Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and trained 
in internal medicine at the Mass Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He was an infectious disease fellow and one of the nation's first uh, geographic medicine fellows at the University Hospitals of Cleveland, where he also served as medical chief resident and faculty member. He serves as full uh, professor of medicine, pediatrics, molecular cell and developmental biology at Brown University and professor and chairman of medicine at Metro Health Campus of Case Western Reserve University. His role at UCR was preceded by a stint as professor and chair of medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin. In addition to his academic background, Dr. Rolds is a tropical disease specialist with extensive experience working in Asia and Africa. And one thing that's not mentioned here is that he's also a specialist on COVID-19. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, quite accomplished in what you've done, Dad. We're really proud of everything um, that you've accomplished over the years. But uh, maybe we should dig into it and just start talking about COVID-19 and how we've got here and, and whatever you want to do. I, I know you being a, you know, I uh, asked if you could come on, I can ask you a couple of questions and being the specialist that you are, you, you, you presented me with a complete talk with slides and stuff. So I guess we should just uh, bring those up and we can kind of proceed from there. Uh, uh, that'd be fine, Michael. Although you missed my greatest accomplishment. What was that? I, I, I am I'm wonderfully married to the same woman for over 40 years, and I have three great sons, uh, including you, Michael. Thank you. Right, thank you, Dad. I appreciate that. And we have a, a great father as well. So uh, let me, I think it's this one. We're going to share that. <clears throat> So while you're getting the slides up, maybe I, I will uh, talk briefly uh, about this. You know, for years I, I have taught in many medical schools, as you could hear from the background, and I always taught the lecture on unusual viruses that occurred in animals that were able to make the species jump to human beings. And over the years, the students say, you know, this is one of the most fascinating talks I've ever listened to, but isn't very relevant to the practice of medicine. Well, suddenly nobody's saying that anymore since <laughs> I'm literally the person that gave lectures on this topic. So I'm gonna start this particular talk with uh, this somewhat whimsical title of Revenge of the Animals. And what that does is it tries to focus on the fact that the COVID-19 virus that we're fighting now is a naturally occurring virus of another species of animals that unfortunately made the species jump to human beings and is causing the current pandemic. So can I have the next slide, Michael? <clears throat> now, we may think that this is the first time something like this has ever happened in the world, and that is not true. Actually, over the history of mankind, there's been a variety of examples of diseases of animals that made the jump to human beings and caused major pandemics. Probably the greatest of them all was the Black Death or the bubonic plague that took place in the Middle, East, uh, Middle Ages. And this was principally an infection of rats that was transmitted to human beings by fleas and caused probably the greatest pandemic in world history. Next slide. Now, uh, this has happened more recently than that so that uh, the swine flu uh, pandemic, or sometimes referred to as the Spanish flu of 1918-1919, uh, was the greatest recent pandemic and literally killed hundreds of millions of people. But it really over the last 20 years, we've had other examples of animal viruses uh, that made the jump to humans. The HIV AIDS pandemic, uh, that was originally a virus of the lesser chimpanzee in Africa that made the species jump to human beings. There was an outbreak of monkeypox uh, in uh, human beings uh, in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Ebola, as you may recall, it was a disease of, of fruit bats and periodically makes the species jump to human beings and causes pretty severe um, uh, small epidemics and pandemics. And there have been three other uh, uh, coronaviruses uh, that are non-human coronaviruses and uh, SARS and MERS were two of those. And of course, uh, for the last year and a half, we have been suffering from COVID-19. And I'll talk uh, in the next slide about where this came from. Next slide. So what all of these infections have in common 
is that they are able to do two things. The first thing that they have to do is they have to successfully be able to jump from one species of animals into human beings and basically cause an infection. But to cause a true epidemic or a pandemic, it has to have a second characteristic. And that is once it infects that first human, those humans have to be able to pass it to human to human to human to human in order to cause an epidemic or pandemic. So it's a two-step process. Now I mention that because there have been viruses, fairly deadly viruses, that were able to jump from an animal species into humans and actually kill that human, but they didn't have the characteristic of being able to transmit it from person to person. And the so-called bird flu would be an example of that. Fairly deadly to humans, but fortunately was not able to be passed to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the sixth generation of humans. Next slide. So let's talk specifically about this coronavirus. Now, the coronaviruses are a family of viruses. There are human coronaviruses and there are animal coronaviruses. And in fact, we as human beings actually have suffered for many years from a human coronaviruses that are common causes of the common cold. And so it's not like we've never seen a, a coronavirus. We just never saw this coronavirus before. Now, if the, this is a picture of a coronavirus and you'll notice those projections that come off the virus. Well, that led somebody who looked at this picture to say, wow, it looks a bit like a crown. And that's where the name coronavirus actually comes from. Now I'll get back to this, but those projections are called the spike protein. And that's how the virus attaches to human cells. And all the vaccines that we'll talk about later basically try to block the attachment of these little projections onto human cells. Next slide. So where did this thing come from? Well, we're not absolutely certain where it came from, but it likely originated in bats. And uh, in fact, the other two non-human coronaviruses that caused epidemics in humans, SARS and MERS, actually came from bats, but they came through an intermediate animal, the uh, Asian civet cat in the case of SARS, and camels in the case of the Middle Eastern uh, uh, coronavirus. And both of those were relatively small pandemics or epidemics. So the closest match of uh, COVID-19 is actually a bat that was a virus that was isolated, interestingly, from a cave about 200 miles from Wuhan, China. Now, currently, we don't know whether that uh, virus uh, came directly from fruit bats into human beings and spread uh, from human being to human being, or an alternative theory is that uh, uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology actually had a copy of that virus from earlier infections and it somehow got loose through a lab accident. We really don't know which of those are true, but probably the original COVID-19 came from a bat. Next slide. Now, there's a lot of talk about COVID and people say, well, you know, I'm not sure I have COVID or I, I could. The problem with COVID is it causes an awful lot of symptoms that look a lot like other infections or other illnesses. So it's often difficult for a person to know, do I actually have COVID or not? Now, there's a couple things you should know. First of all, the incubation period for COVID is between four and seven days. So if you're exposed to somebody with COVID, you won't instantly get infected. It takes actually a few days for the virus to multiply in your body for you to either test positive or for you to develop any symptoms. Now, interestingly, early on, the symptoms are not only fairly mild, but they're pretty nondescript. You get a fever, you get a little cough, you might, uh, you might uh, feel kind of tired or punk, and you really don't know, am I just having a bad day? Do I have some common cold or do I have COVID? Now, the most characteristic finding found in about 60 to 70% of people with COVID is the loss of smell and taste. And so that's a symptom that's very uniquely found in COVID-19. So if you're feeling crummy and you lose your uh, sense of taste or smell, odds are you got COVID-19. Mm. Now, this is a slowly progressive disease. So people get sick, they don't feel very well, but then over the course of the week or so, they get slowly worse and they start developing generally shortness of breath. And then they usually come to the attention of a doctor, either in person or in emergency room. And then uh, basically, if they look like they're not oxygenating very well, uh, they often get admitted to the hospital. 
And even the course from the hospital to dying of COVID, it spreads out over a longer period of time. So often people go into the hospital, they actually are given oxygen, they're staying in a normal bed, then they're transferred to the intensive care unit. And then ultimately people die of COVID by an over exuberant immune response to the virus that's all over the body called acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that's why people die. So from infection to hospitalization is usually about 10 days. And from hospitalization to death, if you're going to die, is usually about a week to two weeks. So this entire infection plays out over a very long period of time. And so that's why when you see a spike in infection in a community, you know that there will be a spike in hospitalizations about a week and a half later. And then there'll be a spike in deaths that will occur about two to three weeks later. So that's why it's because it's a very slow developing disease. Next slide. Now, the other sneaky thing about this is we now know in retrospect that there's a lot of presentations that are caused by COVID that you wouldn't have thought of. So very young children, you may know, have this hyperimmune disease where they have a rash and they, uh, you know, as their major characterization, uh, young people and old people often get blood clots and they have a, a blood clot in the lungs called a pulmonary embolus. Uh, there's a lot of cardiac symptoms that develop because the virus binds to our blood vessels. So people can present with what looks exactly like a heart attack, and it turns out that they're actually infected with COVID-19. And now we know that people can become confused and, and disoriented, and that can be part of COVID-19. And finally, we know that about 25% of people that get infected with COVID have symptoms that last longer than two or three weeks. They can last for months or years, the so-called long haul symptoms of COVID. So <clears throat> the bottom line here is, is that uh, with the exceptional loss of taste and smell, it's sometimes hard to tell if you have COVID in the beginning. It's not a good thing to get. It causes a whole lot of problems. And those that have underlying lung disease or diabetes or heart disease are particularly at risk. And everyone, including younger people, can have long haul symptoms that can last for a long period of time. So for all those reasons, it's not a great idea to get COVID. We should all do everything we can in order to not get COVID. And of course, the best thing to do now is get vaccinated. But I'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. All right, so this is the current situation. And, you know, maybe it's four or five days uh, out. But as you can see, the distribution of uh, in the United States is uh, pretty impressive. And unfortunately, the distribution of this virus at this point is directly related to how many people have gotten vaccinated. So as Michael knows, I'm sitting up there in Vermont, which you'll notice is really light colored because we have the highest vaccination rate in the country. It's uh, you know over 75%. And unfortunately, you guys are all down there in Texas, uh, which has a fairly low, not the lowest, but a pretty low vaccination rate. And that's, of course, why you're uh, dark uh, red. But let's not forget, you know, this is a very serious disease. Uh, there have been over 600,000 people who died in the United States and over 4 million people have died around the world. And by the way, these are gross underestimations. And that's because we now know that a lot of the symptoms uh, of COVID uh, you know, we didn't think we were related to COVID, like those heart attacks and stuff. So the truth is probably a lot more people died of COVID than we gave them credit for. Some people think we're exaggerating these numbers. No, no, no. These are all underestimations. Next slide. So uh, there's, you know, a lot of confusion because people say, well, wait a minute, you told me this six months ago, and now you're changing your tune. So sort of like you're a flip-flopper or something. You know, this is the problem with a brand new disease. When you have a brand new disease, you learn more every month about the disease. And sometimes you have to change your opinions. You just, you know, because it turns out that what you thought were true turns out not to be true. And so this is not that, you know, this unfortunately feeds a lot of people that feed misinformation. Sometimes it's just old information. That was true a year ago, but we now know it's not true. It's not that we have flip-flopped on it. It's just that we had to study and learn in order to know this. So let's just go over some of those issues. We used to think that only sick people could actually transmit the virus. And, you know, this is why we used to screen people to see if they have a fever or not. Well, we now know that people that before they have any symptoms, early in the course of the infection, about half of the transmission takes place with people who are not yet sick. So just... 
thinking that you, you know, you don't have to worry about doing something until you get sick isn't going to block the transmission of this virus. It's interesting how we have flip-flopped, if you will, about mask wearing. This is not due to the fact that we don't know what we're doing. It's that our understanding of the virus has changed. In the beginning, people didn't think much of wearing masks because they knew that wearing non N95 masks are not so great in protecting you from getting infected. But as we learned, wearing masks are really important to keep you, who might not yet be sick, but you could be infectious, from spreading it to other people. So it turns out we now know that wearing masks does help you a little and wearing masks really help you from, keep you from transmitting to other people a lot. And then we went through this period where we said, oh, wow, now uh, immunized people don't need to wear masks and I'll get to it later. Now it sounds like people are going back on that statement. It's again driven by our understanding how the virus has changed. So it's not the same virus <laughs> that we were dealing with a year ago. We used to think that young people didn't have to worry about young people's. People still make this claim. Well, unfortunately, yes, they are less likely to be hospitalized and they're less likely to die than somebody in my age group. But there's no doubt that they can get very sick, they can be hospitalized and they can die. And uh, especially younger people that have underlying problems like asthma or heart disease or other issues. So uh, unfortunately, everybody can get sick from COVID-19 and let's not confuse how commonly it occurs with whether it can occur or not. Now, we also used to think that surfaces were, uh, you know, were very important in the transmission of the virus. And I know, Michael, you've been down there scrubbing your mats and doing all those things. And it's not, you know, that can happen. But we know that most of the transmission of COVID-19 takes place in the air from aerosols. And that's why, honestly, the mask wearing is more important than cleaning all the surfaces. Keep cleaning them, son, but it's just not statistically as important. Next slide. Okay, so uh, we used to think that people were maximally infectious once they became sick and started coughing and stuff. Well, it turns out that people are maximally infected in, in to other people about one or two days before they get any symptoms at all. So this is the idea that you just can't put on a mask when you start coughing or feeling bad. If you're gonna to try to block the transmission, you gotta put the mask on all the time because you'll never know because you don't have any symptoms, whether you're actually spreading the virus or not. Now, we also used to think that everybody that was infected was equally in, uh, infectious. That's not true either. There's a small group of people, so-called super spreaders, that we know actually transmit about 80% of the infection. And again, you don't know if you're a super spreader or not, but if you have a super spreader uh, in your, at your you know, birthday party, then it's likely a lot of people get infected. Now, we used to not know what was important about what activities, et cetera. Well, we now know that uh, transmission is much more common indoors and outdoors, and that large groups with people that you don't know, so that you know people that come from all over are much more dangerous. So things like bars and restaurants. I'll get to that later because one of the advantages you have in the martial arts studio is although you have people there, they're generally about the same people week after week after week. That's a much safer environment than going to a bar where all the people there may have never been there before and they could have come from all over. So uh, we now know that some activities are of higher risk than others. And that's important so we can structure our protection around knowing what's important to do and what's not so important to do. Next slide. Okay, so we, here's the good news. We have a lot of highly effective vaccines. And in the United States, right now, we have three of them. We have the two so-called messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, that's the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. I myself got the Moderna vaccine. And these are two shots about a month apart. The Pfizer is three weeks apart. But uh, these are really effective vaccines. And so I'll get later to what those statistics are. But these are really effective vaccines. And by the way, extremely safe. We also have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine available. It's not quite as good as you can see from the statistics. It's still pretty good. It protects you against hospitalization and death, but it's not as effective as the messenger RNA vaccines. And as the Delta virus is beginning to uh, 
uh, surge, and I'll talk about that later, uh, there are, that basically is exacerbating the difference between those two messenger RNA vaccines and the uh, one Johnson Johnson vaccine. So those of you who said, well, I'm only going to get one shot. <clears throat> I'd rather do that than getting two shots. Well, that was a pretty good idea last year. But that in the future, uh, you know, you may be a bit more susceptible uh, than if you had gotten the, the two shots in the first place. And then there's a whole bunch of other vaccines that are out there. Uh, but since you can't get them in the United States, then we'll talk about them anymore. Next slide. So here's some of the problems. People don't understand the statistics. So let me go over, you know, when they talk about the vaccine protecting you, it depends on what you're talking about. Now, the first issue is, does the vaccine protect you from getting infected at all, anti-infection? Well, uh, that uh, is something that would require you to basically vaccinate some people and give somebody sugar water and then test them for the virus every week for let's say five or six months. And that has been done. And it turns out that these vaccines are very effective in preventing infection of any kind. The one that people quote the most is preventing disease. That's where that 95% and 82% come from. That is the immunized people uh, are protected from getting sick enough that they uh, have symptoms and they come to the attention of the medical profession and vaccines are very effective in doing that. And then finally, the third statistic, which is honestly the most important, but we tend to forget about is the whole reason to get the vaccine, yes, we want to not get infected and we prefer not to get sick. But what we're really worried about is we don't really want to go to the hospital and die. So all the vaccines are highly effective. I mean, virtually 100% effective against hospitalization and deaths. So uh, the vaccines are, are really potent that way. Now, the other place where people get confused is they say, well, you know, I'm older, the vaccines probably won't work as well with me. Well, it's true that the virus distinguishes between older and younger, more fatal and older than younger. But interestingly, all ages are equally protected. So uh, that, that's not a reason either to get or not to get the vaccine. And then as you might also know, a disproportionately number of people that get hospitalized and die uh, are uh, um, uh, uh, people that come from a darker skinned ethnic groups but the good news is the vaccine works equally well in everyone. So again, it's the virus that discriminates between age and races, not, not the vaccine. Next slide. So uh, here's some things we know and don't know. Now we hear a lot about people talking about the short-term and long-term side effects of the vaccines. Uh, let me just tell you from the beginning, these vaccines are the safest vaccines we have. You know, you think nothing of the polio vaccine you got or the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine or the DPT vaccine. These messenger RNA vaccines specifically are safer than all of those vaccines. So, you know, it's interesting when I hear people about the side effects. Now, it is true that you're very likely to get a sore arm. You might get a little low-grade fever. You might feel crummy for a day or so when you first get the shot. I myself felt pretty tired I went to bed at about eight o'clock at night and I slept for 16 hours. That's true, but those short-term side effects are treated with across-the-counter Tylenol or uh, Advil, and uh, they only last for a day. And it's a sign that we're revving up our body's immune system to fight the real virus should we get exposed. But the long-term side effects are virtually non-existent. In fact, it should be reassuring to us now that hundreds of millions of people have gotten the vaccine We've been following all those people. And so we're discovering just a couple very rare complications that take place in like one in a million people. Well, the reason that we now know that they occur in one in a million people is we've been following hundreds of millions of people that got the vaccines. So by now, we're pretty comfortable that although you never say never, uh, there is far fewer long-term side effects from these vaccines than most of the vaccines that you take on a regular basis. Now, what the vaccine really does do is it prevents you uh, principally from getting hospitalization and dying. And the other important thing to keep in mind is if you get infected, you're much more likely to have no symptoms or have only mild symptoms compared if you didn't get vaccinated. Now, we also know that the vaccine actually reduces transmission. So if people are less likely to be infected 
but vaccinated people are also less likely to transmit the disease to other people. So getting vaccinated is an important public health measure as well. Now, uh, we do know that although much less likely, it is still possible for a vaccinated person to get infected and it is still possible that they can transmit it to other people. And that's why people have talked about wearing masks even though you've been vaccinated because although you are much less likely to transmit the virus than people who have not been vaccinated, you still can. And from a public health standpoint, when there's a lot of transmission in the community, we really encourage everyone to wear masks. That's particularly true because people who don't get vaccinated, unfortunately, are the very people that often don't want to wear masks. So, you know, unless you're going to require everyone to be vaccinated, uh, increasingly, it's likely you're going to ask everybody to wear a mask. Now, uh, I already talked about those rare side effects. Let's also talk about the ages. We have an awful lot of experience with people 16 and over and 18 years of older. And we now have a fair amount of experience in people 12 and older. Uh, that vaccine has been released and appears to be very safe. In fact, they actually have less side effects uh, in that age group than they did in the older age group. And probably by, oh, I don't know, October or November, uh, those messenger RNA vaccines are gonna be approved for six and older. And probably after the first of the year, they're gonna be approved for two and older. I've not reviewed that particular data yet, but I think that's likely to happen in the near future. Now, I've also heard, uh, you know, people are now worried about the Delta virus, as you should be, I'll talk about that later. But because the Delta virus is so much more infectious than the old virus that was around last year, I can, I can say with some confidence that if you're not vaccinated, sooner or later, that Delta virus is gonna find you. So, uh, you know, it, it's pretty hard to hide from a virus that is second only to measles among all the viruses in the world in its infectivity. And that's unfortunately what the Delta virus is. And of course, we'll know more in the future. And so, you know, I may come back and talk to you in three or four months and have a somewhat modified story but that's only because we study and we learn from what we're doing. Next slide. Now, I hear all the time from people that they don't wanna get vaccinated. And so, you know, for those of you that are old and are late night fans, you probably remember the old top 10 lists. So I basically came up with the top 10 reasons that people have told me why they don't wanna get vaccinated. And I, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go over each of them and try to convince you that these are not good ideas. So the first one is, oh, this vaccine was rushed. Uh, they took a bunch of shortcuts, I'm gonna wait. Well, it turns out that actually, although they went from <clears throat> starting to work on the vaccine to delivering the vaccine in a very short period of time, they actually didn't take any shortcuts. What they did is they weren't hampered by not having money. Typically, you do animal testing for a year and a half before you ever do human testing, and then you do human testing. And because there was such a critical need for the vaccine, <clears throat> they basically did the, the animal studies and the human studies at exactly the same time. It saved us a year and a half. The other thing that saved us a lot of time is these vaccine manufacturers had already rushed out and developed a vaccine against Ebola. And you may remember that was causing an epidemic about three or four years ago. And so they already were ramped up <clears throat> and had the technology to develop the vaccine and that saved us about six or eight months. So by now, literally hundreds of millions of people have had these vaccines. And I've already told you, <coughs> sorry, these are a lot safer than the vaccines you take, think nothing of taking. Another thing I hear is that people have some kind of chronic disease <coughs> and they worry about taking the vaccine. No, no, if you have a chronic disease, you're likely to die from COVID. So all the more reason to get the vaccine. Actually, people that have diabetes or all these other problems, that's not a reason not to get the vaccine. That's a reason to have a high priority in getting the vaccine because that increases your likelihood of dying. And by the way, you have no increased risk of having an adverse reaction to the vaccine. I hear a lot of times that people say, you know, I have allergies to all sorts of stuff, drugs and stuff like that. Again, that is not a reason not to get the vaccine. Now we know that a small number of people have an immediate allergic reaction to the vaccine. Real small, it's about one in a million, but that's why when you get your vaccine they make you sit there for 15 minutes. So if you have that reaction, 
they give you a shot with an EpiPen and then you're fine. So uh, again, people with allergies, there's no reason to not get the vaccine. Now I've heard that a lot of people say, hey, that COVID-19 is overblown. You know, it's no worse than the flu. I hope nobody's saying that now, but I still hear that all the time. I got to tell you, uh, COVID-19 is a lot worse than the flu. Uh, we've already had more people die of COVID-19 than have died of any flu epidemic except for the, the swine flu epidemic in 1918. And it is right now, last year, COVID-19 was the third leading cause of death in the world. <laughs> That's a pretty significant infection. So no, saying this is overblown or people are, you know, physicians are making up how severe it is. That's just simply not true. Now, <clears throat> some people say, well, so many people gotten vaccinated. I'll be infected by, quote, herd immunity. Well, first of all, we don't know how many vaccinations are necessary for herd immunity. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, not enough people have gotten the vaccine. No more than half the people in the United States are fully vaccinated. And uh, for anything like herd immunity to develop, we probably got to get in the high 80s or early 90s. I've heard that people are concerned about pregnancy or breastfeeding. Turns out that pregnant women are more likely to die of COVID-19 and they're more likely to have stillborns and they're more likely to have uh, low birth weight children. So there's a lot of reasons to be vaccinated if you're actually pregnant, not to avoid vaccination. And my own uh, beloved daughter-in-law that is your instructor, I was the one that advised her to get vaccinated against uh, COVID-19 while she was pregnant. So that's, that's not only not a reason to do it, to not get vaccinated, it's a reason to get vaccinated. There are some women over 55 that are worried about this rare blood clot in the brain. Well, if you're worried about it, just get the Pfizer Moderna vaccine. That rare blood clot is not seen with those. It's seen in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine only. I'm worried that the COVID-19 uh, vaccines might cause problems years from now. That's very unlikely. I can't say that never could happen, but all the components of the vaccine are gone from your body within two weeks. There's no living thing in the vaccine. There's no way that the vaccine can stick into your genes or something. So I think the likelihood of that happening are somewhere between one in 10 million and one in a billion. So I can never say it never happens, but I, I think it's extremely unlikely that would happen. And then finally, the hardest argument I have is this idea that it's my right to not get vaccinated, not wear a mask, not to socially distance. Well, it's probably your right to swing your arms around in the air, but that right stops a millimeter before it hits my jaw. And where getting a vaccine is not only and not just your decision, so that you know I decide not to get the vaccine, so it's my right to get sick and die, is unfortunately. Uh, you're making other people sick and dying. And I think that is not a rational reason to not get vaccinated. We require vaccinations for all sorts of uh, children to attend school. So, you know, this is really a far more severe health problem than any of those childhood vaccinations that we have currently in the United States. Can I have the next slide? So before we move on from the slide, I want to just sure. spotlight a couple of things you said and, and not push back, but just um you know well, you push back on me all the time michael I mean, <laughs> well you know I, I have students from all walks of life and we try to be a center ground for everything and so i don't want this to turn into like a one-sided argument so the first thing i would just say that i totally agree with you on is that you know, hundreds of millions of people have gotten this vaccine and if there was going to be some terrible side effects for all those conspiracy uh prone people out there i think that they would have bubbled up immediately mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we've seen how if there's even one person that gets, you know, shot by a police officer, then it's going to be front and center on the news right away. And so if there were some really terrible uh, side effects and people dying from this vaccine, you would have heard of them. Trust me, they would have been spotlighted. Um, but the things that, that I would push back just a little bit, or I just want to get your opinion on like why you think this happened is I remember when when you know uh, Donald Trump was our president and he was pushing for the vaccine, everyone in the media that I was listening to constantly was saying how they're not going to get this vaccine because they're worried it's, it's being rushed too fast through and that it's not going to be safe. And then, and I even, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I almost remember you expressing some concerns about the, uh, the speed at which it was getting pushed through. <coughs> now I hear 
the complete opposite from media, from you. And so I think they're, that's why some people are concerned. They're just not, they're not sure. They, they worry that maybe there's some grand conspiracy there. Maybe you can shed some light on that. Okay, so this is a classic example of where I showed you the thoughts, what occurred a year and a half from now, and how your thinking changes in six months in a year. Back when the vaccines were first released, each one of those vaccines were given to about 30,000 people. And uh, out of the 30,000 people, about 15,000 got the vaccine and 15,000 got the sugar water. And they proved that the vaccine was effective and they did not see any short, serious short-term or long-term side effects out of the 15,000 people that were in the study. Okay, that's just the facts. And by the way, there were 30,000 in the Moderna study, there was 40,000 in the Pfizer study, there was another 30,000 in the AstraZeneca study. But in each one of those studies, they were only based on about 15,000 people that got the study. So in that setting, at that point in time, you could say, if there is a serious side effect that occurs more commonly than once in 15,000, you would have missed it. Or if there was a side effect that would take two or three months to develop, you will miss it. And so right at that point in time, when the vaccines were first released, the odds that there could have been some longer term side effect or uh, some side effect that occurred less frequently than one in 15,000, I think it would be reasonable to say, you know, I'm a little nervous about this because the data is based on a relatively small sample size. And we know if there's a small sample size, then you could have, you know, a side effect that occurs, let's say one in 50,000 or one in 100,000, or you might have a side effect that takes two or three months to develop and there was feeling on a part of many people that we have to proceed carefully and that maybe we should restrict the vaccinations to those people most likely to die, which were basically nursing home patients, older patients, people with diabetes, et cetera. Now, fast forward a year later. A year later now, hundreds of millions of people have been vaccinated. And by the way, those people are actually studied. When you got the vaccine, you were given the right to actually enter a CDC study for which they would basically text you every week and ask you about side effects, how you're doing, did you, et cetera. And so now we have uh, the perspective of hundreds of millions of people getting the vaccine. Okay, now because of that, and hundreds of millions of people have had the vaccine and they're out six months in a year. Now we can say, what's the odds of there being a side effect? Well, it still could be a side effect, but it's likely that it's less frequent than one in a million. And that's why we've begun to see a couple side effects that occur one in a million. Well, the good news now is uh, that odds are if they, uh, if they find other long-term side effects, they're going to be less frequently than one in a million, just based on that numbers game. And in addition, we're now out, you know, six months in a year, and all of those more serious complications still occur only one in a million. They all occurred within two or three weeks of the first vaccination. So now we have a lot more reassurance that there are not long-term consequences. And the odds of there being a bad reaction to the vaccine now, statistically speaking, are somewhere in one in 10 million, one in 100 million. So this is where people take, it's like, criticism of Dr. Fauci, you I know well. You know, when Dr. Fauci said something about, well, masks are not very effective, he said that in the second week of the pandemic. Well, after a whole lot of studies and science, et cetera, it turned out that that wasn't true. They actually are more effective than we thought they were, They're certainly effective from a public health standpoint. So then when he comes out and says, no, I think we should wear masks, people say, hey, hey, you know, uh, I'm confused. You said this one thing, like, like we're politicians or something, like we flip-flop on issues. Sure. The reason that the we now have a lot more confidence in the vaccines is we have a lot more experience with the vaccines. In fact, I fully expect that they'll be fully, you know, they were released for emergency uh, uh, use because we're in the middle of a pandemic killing millions of people. 
But I expect that they will be fully licensed uh, in the next month or two, uh, just like all the other vaccines that we receive. So this is, I think, what people need to hear. Um, when we play these word games and we try to be hide our vulnerability and say, like, we can never get things wrong, we don't talk about that, that's when people start to, to worry there's some grand conspiracy there. So I think what you're saying, which is that with new information, you know, we've, we've kind of changed our mind on that. And I hope that's that's true. I hope it's not because of who's our president. I hope it's really because we've, we've found... Um, you know, more compelling information to make. Michael, I, I don't want to scare your audience, but I'll tell you another truth thing. I went to medical school in the 1970s. Half of what I was taught in medical school, maybe 60% of what I was taught in medical school turned out to be wrong. We at the time just didn't know which half was right and which half was wrong. So, so, so as we learn more, you know, we admit, listen, we used to give uh, estrogens to women until we found out that we were uh, inducing, you know, we gave them uh, estrogens to treat postmenopausal symptoms. We stopped doing that because we were inducing cancer in those women. Took a long time to figure that out, but once we figured it out, we'd be stupid to keep doing something that we now know is harmful. Yeah. So we learned. We learned. Uh, things. We're gonna have to wrap this up because we're really running. I, I got you. And um, I, I love this conversation. I think that this is the most important thing that we're talking about, actually, in this whole spiel. Um, but uh, I wanted, that's why I want to go just a touch further. And sure. I want to say that ranking, it's not my right to get vaccinated as number 10 is probably the very reason why these people are so upset. Um, because the people who don't want to be told what to do, don't want to be forced to be vaccinated are actually very polite people who don't want to do that to other people. And so when I think one of the reasons why this has become such an issue is not necessarily because people aren't willing to get vaccinated. They care a lot about other people and about this country and about stopping this disease, but they're just sick and tired of being told <clears throat> to do and being forced to do things. And I think a more um, effective approach in handling this would be a more compassionate and understanding one. Um, and I think there's also I don't, I don't, I don't agree with this myself because there's kids to be consider and not everyone can get the vaccine, but there's some people out there would say, and I know with other vaccine, like anti-vaxxers would say something like, well, if you're protected from the disease, and I know it's not hundred percent, but if you're mostly protected from the disease, why do you care so much if it continues to spread? Now, I think with COVID and being a pandemic, it's, a, it's quite a different issue, but that is one of those you know, vaccine things that people talk about a lot, which is like, you know, if you're vaccinated for this thing and everyone's vaccinated, there's one or two people who aren't vaccinated. They say, well, um, why do you care that I'm not vaccinated? Right, well, well, let me comment on that. Unfortunately, a small number of people, for instance, people with cancer, people that have undergone chemotherapy, uh, people that have undergone severe immunosuppression, uh, they, they cannot be protected by vaccination. We know uh, a lot of them. Yeah. We still yeah. recommend that they get vaccinated, but the, but the protection of the vaccine uh, is blunted by the fact that they've had chemotherapy or radiation. And if they get COVID-19, they're very likely to die. The other big group out there is all the kids. Right now, there's all the kids. Now you can say, well, you know, they're less likely to get sick, but they still can get sick and they still can die. So I would argue it's not enough to just make that argument. There are people out there who would like to not die of COVID-19, who would be happy to get vaccinated, but the vaccine is not going to work on them, or they're not old enough to get the vaccine. We largely want everyone to be vaccinated, yes, to stop the pandemic, but we also uh, want to have everyone be vaccinated to protect those people in our community. And finally, this is something about the variants. We now know all of these variants are developing. Why are they developing? Because within each infected people, person, the, the virus multiplies millions, even billions of times. And periodically, a small mistake is made in, in the encoding of the, of the molecules in that virus. And some of them instill in the virus the ability to be more infectious and potentially more lethal. And so the longer that this virus passes around in human beings, uh, the more commonly these variants are that they're going to develop. And as you've seen, each of the successive variants are getting more infectious and more deadly. So <clears throat> if we as a society 
don't do something to try to stop this pandemic, eventually this virus is gonna figure out how to get around the vaccine. And now we're in a world of hurt. So, you know, there is a logical public health reason to do that. And by the way, let's think beyond the United States. We are so lucky that we got more vaccine than we have people. And we are throwing away vaccines because we can't get people to be immunized. And there are people dying all over the world and they would love a vaccine. Talk to a person from India, talk to a person from Brazil, talk to a person from the Caribbean. They would love to get the vaccine to keep from dying and they, there's not enough vaccine out there yet. So yeah. Yeah, let's, I mean, let's hope we can get them all vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it was funny, you were going through the different vaccines and how they're, they're better and worse. And the Johnson & Johnson one was like, kind of like a little bit on the lower end. And that's the only vaccine that they can get in Korea. And so, you know, Master Sunok is a little frustrated that, you know, her mom and dad can't <clears throat> get the better one, but it's just not, it's not possible because they don't have the really good, um, you know, medical um, apparatus, you know, helping them develop these, these vaccines over there. So um, anyway, this is great. Let's we'll move on next slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's good. You know, I want people to know that, you know, they're heard. That's right. It's always a good idea to, I actually think having discussions about this, uh, you hopefully civil discussions are useful because it helps bring out, you know, as long as it's helping bring out the truth. Yeah. So let's talk about, let's okay. talk about, are there any hard hitting questions? You let me know. And I'll, uh, I'll bring them on. <laughs> yeah. We will get, They're all learning that dynamic. The bottom of this, whether yeah. he likes it or not. <laughs> So let's talk about the variants. I've already discussed this uh, uh, briefly, but basically the bottom line is the Delta variant, and we've not heard a lot about it, but you will probably in the future, the Lambda variant, which is the one coming out of South America, is a lot more infectious. And just to give you an idea of how much, how more infectious it is, the original virus, one infected person infected two other people. If you're now infected with the Delta virus, you're gonna infect eight or nine uh, different people. So it's a lot more infectious. The other big impact is we now know in, with the old virus, if you're fully vaccinated, you have a lot, even if you get infected, which is less common, but even if you get infected, you got uh, a lot less virus in your nose. So you're a lot less infectious to other people. But with the Delta virus, it's able to multiply even in people who are vaccinated, and although less vaccinated people get infected in the first place, so it's still having a good effect that way, if you should get infected, you'll be equally infectious to the people that didn't get vaccinated. And so that has changed our thinking about uh, wearing masks. And let's, let's be honest, in the future, one of these variants is going to change so that the vaccines don't work very well. That's exactly what influenza does right now. That's why we have a different flu vaccine every single year. It's not because we're not protected a year later, it's because the virus has changed. And this virus, although it changes slower than the flu virus, if we don't get this pandemic under control, eventually a variant is going to come out for which the vaccine doesn't work. And thank goodness we got scientists working on how we can rapidly develop a quote new vaccine based on the most recent emerging variant. And it'll probably take us about four months uh, to go once that happens to pr uh, produce a new, if you will, booster shot that we'll probably all get to protect us against that new variant. So we could in the future end up getting an annual COVID-19 shot, just like you know, most of us get an annual flu shot. Next slide. So what's my concerns right now, right this minute? Well, uh, government officials in the state of Texas, classic example, are lifting a lot of the public health precautions. Only about half the country is vaccinated. Vaccinated people think that now we're protected, they don't have to worry about anything. And, uh, uh, you know, because of all those things, exactly what's happening is we're having a spike of infection, hospitalizations, and death. And this is at a time which is usually a low point for coronaviruses because generally uh, the transmission is much higher in the winter uh, and uh, in, uh, you know, because of the uh, indoor settings, et cetera. So uh, we're probably in for another difficult couple months. And I hope that people will use this new Delta virus 
to rethink whether they should get vaccines or not. Next slide. So what should you do in the next several months? Well, I think you got to probably keep up some of the social distancing, mask wearing, limiting travel. And I think that bars and indoor restaurants, because there are always new people in there, so there's a lot of mixing. I think that's a little more risky than it was. That's, by the way, one of the, the advantages of your martial arts studio is you have your own extended family. And so one of the advantages you have is, yes, you've got a bunch of people there, but they're the same people. So what you've done is if that's most of their, uh, if you will, mixing activity, the risk is considerably lower. Continue to do all the, these things even though you've been vaccinated because it's uh, useful from a public health standpoint. Please get vaccinated. Obviously, I believe in vaccination. I've been vaccinated. I thank goodness I've talked all my family into getting vaccinated. And uh, you do it whenever your group can. So, you know, when your kids are 12 years of age, get them vaccinated. If they approve a vaccine for those that are six and older, I'd recommend you go get it. Now, if you get sick, call your doctor. Don't go to the doctor's office because you can transmit the disease in the waiting room and go get tested. And there's a lot of drive-through testing areas. And if you then find out you've got COVID-19, well, then you got to quarantine. And the other reason to do that is there's some early treatment. Uh, uh, actually, uh, your mom's uh, Uncle Joe uh, got COVID and he got monoclonal antibodies and he took what could have been a very serious infection and he was out of the hospital in three days. So there is some treatment, but you got to give it uh, early. And uh, finally, I really do think things are likely to get worse this winter. And uh, until we can get more people vaccinated, we're going to continue to have this type of problem. And I think the last slide is really just my question slide. And uh, I know you're going to ask me some uh, questions, son, but let me also say to your, to your uh, uh, students, I would be happy to have you email me with individual questions, and I'll be glad to answer them online. And uh, I know my son has my email, but uh, to give it to you, this is all lowercase, it's g-r-o-l-d-s -G at s-g-u dot e-d-u. And if any of you have questions, I'd be happy you're kind of part of my extended family because you're part of my son's extended family. I'd be glad to answer questions that you might have individually. How many martial arts schools have a uh, specialist on COVID-19 on hand like we do? I mean, probably not too many, but uh, you have to put up with the other side effects, son. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just thinking about, our, I'm looking at the time and I'm realizing this has already gone really long and I want to make sure we get this video out that we don't run out of space. Um, so how about we take these questions and if anyone has any questions, put them in the comments below, or if you feel more uh, comfortable, just send them to us directly. You can send them to me at risingphoenixtkd uh, at gmail.com or at my father's address. And uh, if there's enough questions, we'll get back together and we'll do another one and kind of answer some of those questions and hash out some of those arguments. All right. Dad, thanks so much for coming on. Um, I'm going to stop this share so I can see you better. It was just an honor. You know, you're so accomplished in your field um, that, um, you know, a lot of people got to pay big money to get you to come on their, uh, on their, their shows and stuff and on TV and whatnot. And you're coming on my little, little show, but I really appreciate it. I also appreciate the fact that you don't uh, give me a hard time every day for not going into medicine like you and, and deciding to be a martial artist, which is just a, you know, kind of a thing. I always wanted my children just to find something they loved and do it. And I have ne never been more proud of you. I still remember taking you and your brother when you were a little teeny boy to Taekwondo <laughs> every week. And, uh, you know, uh, it's amazing how much you've accomplished in your lifetime. I'm very proud of you, son. Thank you, Dad. All right. Till next time. If you enjoyed that podcast, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, as well as hitting the notification bell. We offer in-person group and private lessons at our facility in Kyle, Texas, as well as virtual lessons anywhere in the world. If you'd like to learn more about our programs, you can find us online at risingphoenixtkd.com.